Brucham Aboyim. Again, welcome to our home, and thank you for attending. This week, uh, the uh, topic for my thought will be skeletons in the closet. So, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to examine, for us to examine our past. I think that all of us, whether we are Bali Chuva, repentance, or from religious from birth, we all share something in common. Some regrets about the past. Things that we should have done or others that we shouldn't have done. And then there were those things that we should have done just a little bit better. Now, some of those skeletons are thankfully dead and buried. But in reality, it doesn't take much to bring about the resurrection of the dead. I'm afraid that many times, many times our addictions are not really dead. They are just lying in the dust, patiently waiting for an opportunity to come back to life. There was a question presented in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, in the name of Ben Zoma. He asked the question, Ezehu Gibor, who is a strong individual? He answered, Hakovish es Ritz Yitzra, he who subdues his Yitzhahara, his evil inclination. This is a, really, it's a powerful statement the question becomes, how many of us are really able to reach that plateau? How many of us even come close? You know, we are all humans. But I wonder sometimes if that statement turns into a sort of crutch. It does, not, it does, does saying that we are human give us permission to sin? After all, we tell ourselves that, after all, no one's perfect. We can even look into the Torah and we can read about Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, our greatest prophet. He sinned six times. So how are we everyday people expected to address our past? You know, I would think that this question would connect with the question of how are we expected to view our sins? So David Amalek, King David, stated in Psalm 51.6, The chatosi negdi tomid, and my sin is forever before me. What does it actually mean? Are, are we expected to walk around all day in a depressed state of mind and repeat to ourselves over and over again, I am a sinner, I am a sinner? On the other hand, it also states in Pirkei Avot, the Essex of the Fathers, Rasha that one should not be wicked in your own mind. The logic is really very simple. If you perceive yourself as an evil person, the end will be that you will become despondent and sinning will become an inevitability. As the Holy Baal Shem Tov stated, more than your Yetzirah, our evil inclination, wants us to sin, he wants us to be sad. Huh. Then sinning is a certainty. So which is it? I think that the answer lies somewhere between the two. Rav Simcha Bunin would say that a person should keep two notes on his person at all times. In one pocket, he should have a note that reads, on the offer of the Efer, that I am nothing but dust and ashes. And in the other pocket, he should carry another note that reads, Bishvili nivra ha'olam, because of me, the whole world was created. The challenge in life is to know just which pocket one should reach into at any time. Now, in order for us to grow, we must acknowledge and learn from our past. As stated by Rabbi Shimon in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, we read there that Rabbi Yochanan Mazakai, his illustrious teacher, asked his top five students a question. He asked them, which is the proper path that a person should adhere to? Rabbi Shimon's response was, Haroa es one who considers the consequences of his actions, meaning learning from the past. Pretending that we, do, that we don't sin again and again is the sure recipe for failure. Psychologists tell us that the first step in solving a problem is to admit that you have a problem. Many times, we approach the solutions to our challenges as life as all or nothing at all. I think that approaching our sins in that manner more often than not will end in failure and even worse a feeling of despair, which promotes total defeat, and then we, we just give up. We feel that we will never be able to succeed 
that being the case, so why should we try? It's only an exercise in futility. But we need to remember that success can be measured in different ways. You know, I used to play racquetball with a good friend of mine. I was a much better player than he was, and so I always beat him easily. Now, he would constantly agonize over the fact that he lost. So I finally told him, you know, there's no way that he was going to beat me straight up. So I said to him, let me spot you 10 points. That way, even if you only score five points, you can win. Beating ourselves up after a loss or a failure is really a waste of time. We need to take every negative experience that we have encountered in our lives and turn them into successes. True failure is not a possibility if we approach our losses properly. After the fact, if we analyze where we made our mistakes, then they create opportunities for us to grow. You only lose when you give up, otherwise the game is still on. We need to view ourselves as players, not spectators. You know, spectators can leave the stadium whenever they want. Players are required to stay on the field until the game is over, no matter what the score is. As the saying goes, it ain't over until it's over. They tell the story of Abzusha, who was lying on his deathbed. He was crying and his students asked him, Rebbe, why are you crying? He said to them, you know, I'm not concerned that the heavenly court will ask me, why wasn't I like Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher? No. I'm concerned that they are going to ask me, why wasn't I like Zusha? On our journey in life, we have all taken detours. Those detours may have taken us into dark and godless places. Places that seduce our bodies and confuse our minds and our morals. Nonetheless, they are not without purpose. After all, they have taught us many lessons. As the saying goes, good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. There is a saying that, uh, that there is nothing, pardon me, that occurs in our lives that is without a positive purpose. Sometimes we just need to look a little deeper and then review it all in the context of time. In Hasidus, there is a saying about a Yerida L'Tzorach Aliyah, which means a descent for an ultimate ascent. If someone were to ask you to jump as high as you can, well, the first thing that you should do is bend down as low as you can. Then, the lower that you bend down, the higher you will be able to jump up. Those skeletons in our closet represent some of the lowest points in our lives. But nonetheless, they create opportunities for us to grow the most. You learn nothing from success, but you learn a whole lot from failure. Every experience that you have encountered throughout your life is exactly what has fashioned the whole person that you are today. Remove one episode that occurred in your life, even one that you failed at, and you would not be the same person that you are today. You know, the stairway to heaven is paved with steps that we have created through our failures and disappointments. These negatives become an important ingredient in our lives. They not only help us to grow, they force us to grow. They help us to realize that we must do better than we have done in the past. In life, experience is the greatest teacher of all. It has a way of teaching us that many times that which we perceive as bitter in our lives is an essential ingredient in making everything else in our lives better. I've heard people say that they have sinned so grievously in their past that there's really no way that they can ever be forgiven by God Almighty. So they just give up. That's not who God is. He is a benevolent father whose greatest trait is called Erech long-suffering. God is in no hurry to punish the sinner. His main objective is only to wipe out the sin. Sinning allows us to be human. The fact that we sin and yet we still accept ourselves opens the door for us to be more compassionate and understanding to other people who are also sinners. You know, the Torah tells us in the portion of Kedoshim, 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Meaning that just as you love yourself, even though you may not deserve it, so too should you love your neighbor, though they too may not deserve it. They are no worse than we are. They may just have different challenges that they must overcome. You know, in the end, we are all stuck on a piece of bubble gum. Everyone that sees us standing there knows that what we are standing on is only bubble gum. But to us, it feels like cement. Life is based on perception, not reality. If only we could view our challenges as clearly as we view someone else's. The opening Mishnah in Pirkei Ovos, The Ethics of the Father, was taken from the Tractate of Sanhedrin. It is not part of Pirkei Ovos at all. It states that Kol Yisrael Yeshlehem Chelek La'olam Habu, that every Jew has a portion in the world to come. This statement, this is a statement said to a person who has been convicted by the Jewish court of murder. Before he is about to be executed by the court, the chief justice of the Sanhedrin, Can you do something. Well, hopefully, it'll come back. There's a little technical difficulty. But we will continue. Hopefully you can hear. Before, there you go. Before he's about to be executed by the court, the Chief Justice of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, tells the murderer that even, even he has a portion in the world to come if he only truly confesses his sin and asks God for forgiveness. Imagine, if a person who has been convicted of murder by the Jewish court can be forgiven for their grievous sin. And that not only that, but they can also achieve forgiveness, but they still there still exists the possibility for them to attain a portion in the world to come. This fact should allow all of us to look at our skeletons in the closet just a little differently. Yes, we may have done some terrible sins in the past, but does it really compare to murder? We read in the Torah in the portion of Kisisa, the Jewish nation, 40 days after they received the Torah from God Almighty himself, make a golden calf. We also read that though it was an unconscionable sin, still, God was able to forgive them. The Talmud asks, how was it possible for the nation to have sinned so grievously, especially after their close encounter with God on the mountain? The Talmud answers, that in reality there was no way that they could have sinned so soon and in such a denigrating fashion. It was all the hand of God who orchestrated the event. He did so with the intent of teaching all sinners in the future that there always exists the possibility for tshuva, repentance. It makes little difference what sins you may have transgressed in your lifetime. They all pale in comparison to the making of a golden calf at the foot of the same mountain where the nation had just received the Torah directly from God Almighty himself. The commentaries tell us that God did not punish the people for the sin of the golden calf at that time. Rashi tells us that God said that every time that the nation will sin in the future, I will remember the incident with the calf. Now, there are those commentaries that explain that God's statement meant that whenever I punish them in the future for a sin, I will add just a little more punishment for the sin of the calf. The Chidushi Arim, the Ger Reb expounded on this verse, but in the exact opposite direction. His interpretation of God's statement was, God said in reference to the sin, that every time in the future when the Jewish nation will sin, I will think about their punishment and I will remember the incident with the calf. God says, I will say to myself that just as I was able to forgive them at that time, so too will I be able to forgive them for any and all sins that they transgress in the future. I think that somehow in Judaism, we view sins and sinning in a different way. 
The Talmud tells us that a Baal Tshuva, a person who has repented, is even greater than a tzaddik, a totally righteous individual. It would seem that the mountain that a Baal Tshuva is forced to climb is in some ways even higher and steeper than that of a tzaddik. But in the end, their climb makes them stronger and more appreciative of all the many blessings that they receive in their lives. All of their skeletons in the closet are reminders for them of where they came from and an appreciation of where they are now. It creates within them not only an obedience to the Creator, but also a feeling of true love and admiration towards our Father in Heaven. You know, the morale of Prague was asked by its students, who would bring Mashiach, who would bring the Messiah? He answered them, Baal Tshuvas, those individuals who have left the fold and have since returned. They bring with them a deep and strong love for God a desire to reattach, reattach themselves to God our Father in Heaven. He comes wrapped in warmth and enthusiasm. The Rebbe, from Menachem Mandel Schneerson, of blessed memory, taught that according to Rashi, the Kuruvim were formed in the image of young children. From, the fact, from that fact, we learn a great lesson. Our sages tell us that the Torah preceded the creation of this world by some 2,000 generations. They state that God Almighty looked into the Torah as a sort of blueprint for the creation of this world. They also tell us that the thought of creating Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, preceded even the Torah. We read that the Keruvim were placed above the Torah, the Luchos, the two tablets that were resting in the ark. The two tablets and the Keruvim were separated by a cover called the, Kap the, Kap the Kaporis, which, which alludes to the Hebrew word kapara, which means forgiveness. So we see that God Almighty's relationship with the children of Israel is much like the relationships that exist between a father and his child. This bond is therefore even higher than Torah itself. So that even though we may sin, God is always looking to forgive us. This is much like the scenario that exists between a father and his special beloved child, based on Lukuti Sichos. You know, it's not our job to change the past. After all, changing the past is not a possibility. It's history. However, by changing our present and our future, we have done much more than just change our past. We have found a way to change our negative actions, our sins, into positives. In fact, our sages tell us that if we do what's called tshuva me'ahava, if we can repent out of love, we actually have the ability to turn our transgressions into mitzvot, good deeds. That, of course, is in reference to our spiritual standing in heaven. But as I've mentioned before, if we learn anything from our transgressions, don't we actually turn our misdeeds into mitzvot, even here on earth? We may not be able to change our previous negative action into something positive, but by changing our perspective, we can become better and more righteous individuals in the future. We need to place our emphasis on the present. We need to live each day to the best of our ability. We need to focus on that which is in front of us so that we don't stumble. You know, there's a reason why God placed both of our eyes in the front of our heads. Constantly looking backwards is both dangerous and a waste of time. Forget about the skeletons in your closet. After all, God Almighty already has. And with that, let us help usher in the coming of Shia Tzikana quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for attending. Again, we wish you all happiness and health and success. You should only know from good. Again, Shabbat Shalom. And by the way, this is the week come, upcoming, which will be Purim. Again, have a happy Purim. Enjoy. Don't get too drunk. <laughs> God bless and be well.